Welcome to the Casual Campers Podcast, your home for the best camping discussion both in and out of the field. Here are your hosts, Tim and Aid. Hello and welcome to this week's Halloween special of the Casual Campers Podcast. It is only me, I'm afraid, Tim. Uh, we've had a little bit of technical issue, you could probably you could probably say that. Um, the gremlins are definitely real on this Halloween special and uh, and Ed is with us in spirit only. We had a bit of a chat about what we were going to do for this and we decided that we would put out a couple of campfire stories. Scary, hopefully. Not too scary. No nightmares. Maybe nightmares. Who knows? It could be a big scary pants like me. Um, so we're just going to put out a couple of a couple of uh, campfire stories for you. One's a bit shorter, one's a bit longer. And in the middle, we're, you are going to get to listen to Ed. He's going to do a, uh, a kit review for us that he's pre-recorded, which is great. Um, so we're just going to jump straight in with our, our first scary story. Are you sitting comfortably? The Night Chase A Casual Campers Podcast Original Story John caught the last train home. Sadly, the last train didn't stop in his village. It stopped in the next village, just over a mile away. To be honest, the day train didn't stop in John's village. It didn't have its own station. That didn't normally bother him. The road between the two was as straight as an arrow, and even on a murky grey day you can see the whole length of it. But at night, this night, there was no moon. The clouds were thick, heavy, hung low. It wasn't raining, but somehow the atmosphere just felt cold. He wrapped his coat tight around him, tied the belt, pulled the collar up tight, and set off to walk. There were street lights, but after the first twenty yards, you passed the last one that was still working, and you entered a dark realm where you could barely see the hand in front of your face. The road was straight, though. He knew if he just kept going straight, he would get home. He'd reach his own village, his own front door, a cup of tea, a warm fire, and he'd go to bed. He hadn't gone far into the darkness when he thought he could hear somebody behind him on the road, some distance away, and he turned and looked, and as he turned... The footsteps stopped, but he couldn't see anything. He could see the streetlights down the road, back at the train station. There was nobody stood illuminated by those, and there was nothing between them and him. He shrugged his shoulders, turned round again, started to walk. He hadn't gone more than just a few paces when he was certain he could hear the footsteps again, and he stopped, turned, looked behind him. And again, there was nothing. He could still see the street lights by the train station a little further away now. There was nothing between him and there, and there were no footsteps approaching. OK, he thought. Turned round, started to walk on. Stepped a little quicker this time. Thought, well, I will get myself home. Let's just focus on what I need to do, and I'm going to get myself home. But the footsteps were there. And as he was walking quicker, so were the footsteps. John increased his pace again. The footsteps behind increased theirs. He stopped dead in his tracks, spun round on his heels, looked behind. Nothing. Nothing there. He called out into the darkness. Nothing but his echoed voice came back eventually, somehow bouncing off the trees or the clouds or the road or somewhere, but nothing else. He turned again, set off at a good pace. As soon as he had, the footsteps were there. He wasn't turning round this time. He was going. Faster and faster he walked, until it was more of a jog that he was doing. Still, the footsteps behind him kept pace. Now he started to run, 
thought, I'm not doing this. I'm going for it. And he started to run and run. Still, the footsteps were behind him, keeping pace, running just as fast as he was. John went faster, faster than he'd run before. He's not a healthy specimen. He's never run properly in his life, but he was running now, flat out as fast as his feet could take him. And he was going and going and going. But so were the feet behind him. Just as fast, step for step, they felt so close, he wasn't turning round. He was running and running. His legs were burning, burning and burning. His heart was pounding out of his chest. He could barely catch his breath. His asthma was on the verge of an attack. He thought, I can't go any further. I'm not going to make the village. Right, that's it. I'm stopping. And he stopped, spun on his heels again, ready to fight what was ever right behind him. Nothing was there. As he stopped, his coat fluttered. The belt and the buckle from his raincoat smacked him across his chest. It had been his belt the whole time. Every time he moved, it whacked against him. It made the noise. The quicker it went, it went quicker. He realised how stupid he'd been. How foolish to have been so frightened. He even laughed out loud as he turned back towards his own village to carry on at a much more gentle pace. And as he turned the village, he didn't feel the pitchfork enter his chest. You nearly got away from me, boy. (laughs) Hope you liked that one. Not too scary, not too scary. Just in case you are, let's jump straight into our uh, our kit review for you. And you can listen to uh, to Age Review. Welcome to the Casual Campus Kit Review. Your home for an honest opinion of the equipment Tim and Aid have been using this week. Hello, this is Aid, and this is my first tent review for my Snow Peak pack and carry fireplace. As the name suggests, uh, yes, it's Snow Peak. Nobody would be surprised by uh, that as one of my favorite things. But pack and carry means that it does pack down flat. So rather than it being a uh, fire pit that you're carrying around, a big bowl or whatever that is, this one concertina is down through two, three or four little hinges. uh, And it packs down into a little triangular shape. So years ago, I was looking for a a fire pit, mainly because a lot of the campsites that would allow fires also would only allow them if they were raised off the ground. For me, uh, I needed to find a bit of kit, you know, why not? A little excuse that's something that I could carry around. And I have to say, after much research, Snow Peak, as you would have guessed, would be the place that I found something that just looked great uh, and what I wanted to uh, invest in. Uh, It wasn't a cheap piece of kit but having said that I mean I've owned it for about 15 or 20 years. I've used and abused it in that time and it's something that comes with me just about every single time. Uh, It's something that when I'm camping with groups of friends, it tends to be the fire pit that we use if we're not using the ground. Uh, And yeah, actually, although it has been quite expensive um, in that initial outlay, it's something that I've got more use out of. Tents have come and gone, stoves have come and gone. That's the bit that keeps keeps coming with me and I'll have it for years. Um, It's... It, yeah, it is uh, one of those bits. I think, snow, like a lot of Snow Peak things, they are um, heritage pieces. They're things that you would give back down to, you know, pass down to family members. Uh, you know, the pros for this here are that, you know, it is virtually indestructible. I've had it that time. Um, it's spent many winters outside, and the main body of the pi- piece is stainless steel so it doesn't rust 
Uh, it comes with a lifetime guarantee and like I say, it is virtually indestructible. It's spent many winters outside where we've had a fire in the middle of winter and then I've not really been bothered to pack it away. You know, you've got all the fire stuff in the bottom of it. It's rained for a few days and then and that's gone on for weeks. So yeah, it's spent months outside in the middle of winter and the only real difference to what it was new is that it's got scorch marks on it. The rest of it is still intact. It's absolutely uh, a, a brilliant piece of kit, very solid. So um, it does come with grills so that you can cook on top of it. There's a grill bridge that just uh, handily attaches to the sides of the uh, fire pit itself. Uh, you've got three different levels there so that you can raise it up and down depending on how hot the coals are. Uh, and yeah, uh, other than the grill itself, that's got a bit of wear and tear as all grills tend to do that are stainless steel. So there's a bit of rust on there. I have to keep on scrubbing that off. But for everything else, it still looks brand new. Um, I think for the cons of it, it's heavy. You know, there's no getting away from it. You can't have something that is that indestructible. Uh, so I think it comes in at just under f uh, 15 kilos. Um, so yeah, if you're um, using it in the back garden, you're using it on a campsite, it's a bit more car camping than anything else, but you know, you wouldn't mind taking it to the beach as well if you can't have uh, a fire actually on the sand, you know, sometimes you, uh, you're you not allowed to, but you could carry it down there and uh, it's definitely uh, worth that. I think the other con really, cons, pros, cons, is the cost. Uh, so some people go £240 uh, for the basic fire. That's quite a lot. But saying that, you know, I've also got the Biolite um, fire pit. That's £200 now. Uh, a, a little bit more if you want some of the extra kits to it. And it, that's not nearly as robust as the Snow Peak one is. Um, I think if you get the whole set, you can get it all for £343 at the minute in the UK. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, it's one of my favourite bits of kit. It comes with me every time I go camping. We use it in groups. People expect me to bring it so that they can cook on it. And ultimately, um, yeah, something that lasts like it has done. Um, yeah, that £240 is quite a cheap price, I think. Anyway, if you're uh, in the mood for a fire pit, Snow Peak, have a look at what they do. So that was Aid talking about his fantastic fire pit. He has had that for donkey's years. Donkeys and donkey's years. I think it was like one of the first main pieces of kit he ever bought. And it's been the envy of pretty much everyone who's been camping with him ever since. And uh, you know, it's just it's just great. It's so solidly built, it's just going to last forever. It'll be something that he'll he'll hand down. You could call it an heirloom piece, quite frankly. It's just one of those one of those pieces of kit that that it will have many other lives long after the casual campers have put out our our candle. Speaking of which, it is Halloween. I hope you like the first story. We're now going to jump straight into our second story. It's a little bit longer. Hope you stick with it. Um, have a good time, don't have nightmares, and uh, we'll see you next time. Wendy's Revenge, a Casual Campers podcast original story. Gary was an alright chap. Quiet, really. Not a lot of friends. Just past his 50th birthday worked in the local planning office, in the local council. One of those quiet people, got on, did his work, did his job, did it well, but didn't have a lot of friends at work. Never got invited really for a, a drink after work. And actually last Christmas, he didn't get invited to the Christmas do. That kind of chap, we all know a Gary. His life had taken a funny turn in the last couple of years. He'd recently turned 50, well, a few years back. Things had kind of fallen apart. He'd lost touch with his family, any friends that he'd had from years ago, 
And actually, more recently, he'd lost his home and was sleeping in the back of his car most nights. Either that or this nice, quiet, wooden glade he'd managed to find that was a bit secluded and people didn't really know he was there. Gary hadn't been to work for a couple of days. It could have been more than a couple of days, but actually, nobody really noticed. But eventually, people did start to notice that he wasn't answering emails and his work wasn't getting done. Missed a couple of deadlines. Somebody eventually went to his office and realised Gary wasn't there. They looked on their HR files to see, well, who do we call if Gary's not in? Gary didn't have anyone to call. They didn't know what to do. Eventually, a couple of days later, they phoned the police. And the police came, checked his office, decided to put a search out for his car. They found his car another couple of days later, parked up down a track, farm track grassy track, bit secluded, hidden away. All of his possessions were in the back of the car, as much as you could fit in a small car. But Gary wasn't there. The police searched around the car. It was clear that nobody had tampered with it. Nobody had been around it. Doesn't Didn't look like it had been stolen. Looked like it was intentionally parked somewhere a bit secluded. They got some search dogs and decided to search the woods that the car was parked next to. After a few hours, the dogs came across a small little camp. Just a one-man tent. A little fire had been lit long since gone out. Inside the tent, when they zipped it open, Gary wasn't there. His things were there, though. It was clearly Gary. His wallet, his clothes, an old family photo of two young boys and their mum. A sleeping bag, a sleeping mat. The essentials for what looked like a single overnight camp. But Gary, he wasn't anywhere to be seen. And the dogs, they had his scent, but there was nothing to follow. Gary didn't walk out of that camp. Gary wasn't there. Let's go back. Way back. 50 years ago. Well, 50 years and a few days, if you want to be precise. Back to the early 1970s. We're in a sleepy little northern English town. Not a lot going on. There's two kids. They're quite young. One's four. One's probably about six. They're out on the street playing on their own. Nobody watching. Nobody supervising. It was a different time back then. Let's be truthful. They were just looking for fun. No malice. You know, they're only kids. They certainly weren't looking for trouble. Not that day. Down the street was Wendy. Wendy was probably as old as the older boy. Six-ish. She also was on her own, unsupervised. Wendy had a skipping rope. She loved that skipping rope. She was skipping away, singing some funny little skipping song and was just away in her own world, having a great time. These two boys, they decided they'd quite like that skipping rope. It wasn't theirs. They'd been brought up reasonably well. They knew that they shouldn't take what isn't theirs. But you know what? They were two brothers, and they were a bit bored. So they kind of asked Wendy if they could have the skipping rope. Wendy, of course, was like, no, I'm skipping. I really love my skipping rope. I'm skipping. You can't have my skipping rope. 
And they kind of asked her again, well, we, you know, can we have it for a little bit and have a bit of a play? And Wendy was like, well, no, I'm playing with my skipping rope. I really love my skipping rope. Leave me alone. To which there was then a little bit of a, a push and a shove and a shove and a push and a pull and a push and a grabbing of a skipping rope and a pulling of hair and, and a, there might have been a kick and there might have been a bit of a scream and before they knew it, the boys had grabbed the skipping rope and shoved Wendy really hard so that she fell backwards off the curb and into the street. And the boys, in their hand, had a skipping rope. What they didn't see was the little blue MGB speeding down the road that also didn't see that Wendy had toppled straight into its path and it wasn't able to stop. The car hit Wendy. She flew into the air. She bounced across its bonnet. It screeched to a halt. And Wendy skidded across the road and lay there, not moving. For what seemed like an age, the boys just stood there, not knowing what to do. There were four. There were six. The man in the car also didn't move. It was like time just went dead. Eventually, he jumped out of the car, raced round, picked up Wendy, put Wendy in the back of the car and shot off again as fast as he could. And the car was gone. And the boys were left there on the edge of the road, alone. They looked at each other. The younger looked like he was going to cry, but he didn't. They went home. They didn't tell their mum. They didn't tell their dad. They didn't tell anybody what they'd done or what they'd seen. And nobody, nobody knew what happened to Wendy. Because Wendy was never, ever seen again. Come forward again. 50 years to be exact. Exactly 50 years to the day. And Gary... He's pulling his car into the little grass track, far enough off the road that nobody would see it if they were passing, but not so far that he might think, oh, this might get a bit stuck if it rains and I'll never get to work in the morning. He got his bits and bobs. It was going to be a clear night. He decided he didn't want to sleep in the small car. He's six foot, he's Gary, and he doesn't really fit in a tiny little car. He'll do it if the weather's going to be bad, but actually what he preferred to do was spend the night in a little tent. You see, camping is Gary's happy place. That's where he feels most relaxed, most at home, sleeping under canvas, having a little fire. And that's what he was going to do that night. He got his little one-man tent, got his sleeping bag, got his little stove, got his little wash kit, his fire kit, and he walked off into the woods. He didn't like to stay anywhere near the edge. He liked to move quite deep into the woods. Be away from everybody else. So that he could have a fire and nobody would come looking and, and tell him to clear off. Found a little clearing. He'd been there before. He set up his tent. Got the fire going. Warmed up some food. It wasn't anything fancy. It was a tin of chicken curry and some boil-in-the-bag type rice that he just threw in and hoped for the best. He wasn't uh, wasn't really into cordon bleu camp cooking, but it filled him and it made him warm. He got his bedroll out, sleeping bag, got everything in there. The fire started to die down, so he thought, I'm going to get in my tent. He got undressed and put his pyjamas on. Still wore pyjamas even though he's out in the woods. And when he was putting his things to the side, he realised there was a photograph in his wallet and he had a look at it. And it was a photo of 
of two young boys. And he couldn't believe what he was looking at. This isn't a photo he'd ever seen before. It was him. He was sure it was him. He was the younger boy. His brother was the older one. And there there was their mum. But he, he had never seen this picture before. He certainly didn't know he had it. And it, he absolutely hadn't put it in his own wallet. And he just stared at it. Mesmerised. And memories came flooding back. Memories he thought were somehow a dream. Somehow a nightmare. He hadn't thought of those memories for a very, very long time and had never spoken to anybody about them. His thoughts were broken by the crack of a branch close by the side of his tent. Gary turned. Who's there? he shouted. There was no sound. He waited. Who's there? There was no sound. No voice anyway. There was a rustling amongst the grass and the leaves. Another twig snapped. This wasn't a badger. This wasn't a fox. Nothing was rustling through the undergrowth. This was footsteps. Light footsteps, but footsteps all the same. They were moving down the side of the tent. Who's there? shouted Gary, more forcefully this time. Still, no voice came back. The steps moved forward to the front of the tent. Gary had fear in his eyes and a cold chill running down his spine, like that feeling when the fire's gone too low on a winter's camp, but this wasn't a cold night. Who's there? The steps moved forward, closer, closer. The zip on the tent slowly started to move up. Someone was coming in. PC Burroughs had been with the police for about three weeks. Straight out of police school, if that's what you'd call it. He was keen. He wanted to do murders. He wanted to solve bank robberies. He wanted to catch the big villains. Not today, though. He was doing missing persons. And actually, they hadn't even found the missing person. They just had a load of stuff. And it was his job to actually log it all. And that was boring the heck out of him. But it's what he had to do because his sergeant was watching. Down on his bit of paper, he was logging everything. A wallet. Some cash. A photo of two kids and a woman. Some food, his camping stove, his sleeping mat, his tent. PC Burroughs picked up his sleeping bag and he went, Sarge, there's something in this. Oh, ah, lad, what is it? Crown jewels. PC Burroughs stuck his hand deep inside the sleeping bag, rooted around for what he could find, grabbed hold of it, pulled it out and went, Sarge, it's a skipping rope. It's free. Welcome to the Casual Campers One Minute Mindfulness, but is it rain, fire or sizzling sausages? You decide. 